Well, back in 1955, missionaries Nate Saint, Jim Elliott, Pete Fleming, Ed McCulley, and Roger Udarian first made contact with what was known as the Wadani people, which was a remote native tribe deep in the rainforest of Ecuador. And this tribe was known for their, their violence, kind of the severe ways that they would seek revenge against anyone they felt had wronged them. And these missionaries set out to engage them with the gospel. And in 1956, following weeks of really making good progress in sharing gifts with the Wadani as a way to begin to establish contact, there was a, kind of an inner conflict that broke out within the tribe. And one of the Wadani, in order to deflect accusations against himself, blamed these missionaries that had showed up. And so a group of the Wadani marched over to this place along this river, this beach where their plane had landed, and they proceeded to kill these five missionaries with their spears. And if you've ever seen the movie, The End of the Spear, which kind of captures this story, you know that the death of these five men was not the end of the story. That some of the wives of these men, including Elizabeth Elliot and uh, the sister of Nate Saint, Rachel Saint, they continued this work even after the death of these men. They continued to live among the Waudani and continued to work to see the gospel proclaimed among this tribe. And eventually these, these men, the, this Waudani tribe, they were amazed by a couple things. One, they were amazed by the fact that these missionaries actually had guns with them and chose not to use them while they were attacked. And the other thing is that they were amazed the fact that these women would not choose to seek revenge against them, which was kind of their way. And the women just chose instead to forgive them and live among them and continue to share the gospel with them. And, and uh, over time, these, this tribe became, be, came to know the gospel, came to believe the gospel. And so the message about the power of the blood of Jesus carried to this tribe by the blood of these five men helped transform this entire culture of this tribe. They, they were able to find peace. They were able to find reconciliation and forgiveness in a very powerful and transformative way. And so the focus of our passage this morning is that very same transforming power of the gospel to bring peace among people who are both hostile to God and hostile to one another, hostile to other people. As God forms one people, as he builds his church for himself from every nation, every tribe, and every language of the world. And so we're going to continue in our series in the book of Ephesians. If, you're, if you've been with us, if you're just joining us uh, today, we've been walking through the book, uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And we're going to be in chapter 2 this morning. So if you have your Bible, you can open to Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to look at verses 11 through 22 this morning. Verses 11 through 22. So the Word of God says, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace." And might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Would you pray with me? Lord, as we come to your word here, we first want to just praise you for the great reconciling power that you work for us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. 
that his death makes peace possible for us, between us and you, Lord, and between us and other people. So we praise you for that, Lord. We ask for your help as we turn to your word, that you would give us eyes to see wondrous things out of your word this morning. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So and if we remember back to the end of chapter 1, uh, it had talked about the power of God that he works for us through Jesus. Verse 19 of chapter 1 had said, uh, talked about the immeasurable greatness of God's power toward us who believe that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. And then the, we talked about last week, the beginning part of chapter 2 talks about how God works this power toward us at an individual level. How while we were dead in our sin, through Christ he makes us alive and gives us a position with, with Christ and gives us a purpose of bringing him glory uh, through the good work, the good that he works through us. And now the second half of chapter 2, we really, it's, we're still talking about this power of God, but now what we're seeing is the power of God applied to us at a kind of a corporate level. As a group of people, God redeeming a people for himself as he builds his church. And so that's why our main point this morning is that we must trust in Jesus. We must turn to Jesus to find peace with God and to be, find peace with one another. To be joined together as fellow citizens of God's kingdom as he builds his church in this world. And so last week we saw the structure of our passage was how we were dead in our sin, made alive by Christ, and then the implications of being made alive in Christ. Well, our passage this morning really has the same uh, structure, has a very similar structure. How What we'll see is that we were separated from Christ, now we're brought near by Christ, and then we'll talk about the implications of being brought near by Christ, which is really being at peace with Him. And so first... We were separated from Christ. Verse 12, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And so one of the few kind of direct explicit commands that we see here in these first three chapters of Ephesians. If you remember back to our introduction in the book of Ephesians, we talked about how chapters 1, 2, and 3 are really heavy with explaining what the gospel is, really heavy on kind of the theology and what we believe and what God has done. And then chapters 4, 5, and 6 are more heavy on this is how you live it out. These are the commands. Well, one of the few commands that we see in the first three chapters is right here in verses 11 and 12. And both verses uh, charge us with to do the same thing, which is remember. Remember. We need to remember where we were and who we were so we can better celebrate and worship God for where we are now, where he has brought us to, and where he's yet taking us, the, what, the purpose he has for us. And so prior to Jesus, those outside of Israel really had no idea that the promises of God were for them too. Right? God knew. God knew what he was up to. God knew his plan and his, his purpose from the beginning to create a people from every nation that would glorify himself. Yet even though there were indications of this in the uh, Old Testament, this was still largely a mystery to both Jew and Gentile at the time uh, of Jesus and prior to Jesus. And so we're going to talk more next Sunday about kind of the unveiling of this mystery uh, of how Gentiles are welcomed into the family of God as well. And so that's why Paul says that Gentiles, and if you haven't heard that word before, Gentiles, we're just, it's just referring to all non-Jewish people. So Jew and Gentile, Jew and basically everybody else. And so that's why Paul says the Gentiles were separated from Christ, alienated from Israel, and strangers to the promises of God. Okay, Gentiles were largely living without God. And when you live without God, you live without hope in this world. And so just as we were individually dead in our sin apart from Christ, so collectively as a people, we were separated from Christ too in our sin. And so what does it mean to be separated from God? Why does that matter? When the Bible tells us about in our sin we're separated from God, why does that matter? Well, if we think all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve eat the fruit and they sin against God, we see kind of this first... Uh, appearance of separation being a result of sin. 
Sin curses all of creation, and really the punishment for uh, sin is a separation from God. Adam and Eve lose this deep intimacy they had in the garden with God. And so God sends, God sends them out of the garden, and he places a, a cherubim, an angelic being, at the entrance into the garden with a flame and sword that now kind of fixes that separation between unholy man and holy God. And this separation is necessary for that very reason, because of the holiness of God. He cannot and will not permit sin to be in his presence. And we, because of the fall, are sinful even by our nature, at our very nature. It, we're separated from God apart from Christ because of sin. That's why Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. And so sin separates us from God. It breaks that peace between us and God. And when peace between us and God is broken, the weight of our sin falls full force on our own shoulders. We're now responsible to deal with our own sin if we're not at peace with God. And it's crushing. It's unbearable to us. The guilt and condemnation that come with sin is overwhelming. And we feel this weight. We feel it physically in our bodies. We feel it mentally and emotionally. And we experience it relationally in, in broken relationships. And actually, if, if you turn to Psalm 38, Psalm 38 kind of touches on this, this idea of the weight of our sin upon us. Psalm 38, just the first four verses, although more of the, the psalm touches on this. But just the first, looking at just the first four verses. It says, O Lord, rebuke me, not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. For your arrows have sunk into me, and your hand has come down on me. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. Okay? Like a heavy burden. That's what happens when the weight of our sin falls upon our own shoulders. This is what it means to be alienated, to be separated, to be living as strangers with God. To have the weight of your sin upon your own shoulders. And so when, when that happens, we're left with two options. We have two options. We can either harden our conscience to our own sin. We can just kind of pretend it's no big deal. Just kind of sear ourselves to it and act like we're okay when really deep down we're not. We're not. And that's the problem with this approach is you may try and put on a, a, a good facade. It may look good on the outside, but inside you're still carrying that burden of your sin and it weighs you down. Or the other option is we can acknowledge our sin and we can find one who can carry the weight of our sin for us, which is exactly what we find in Jesus Christ. And so we can humble ourselves and we can come to God and we can confess our sin, we can acknowledge our sin and we can acknowledge our need for someone to carry the weight of our sin upon them instead of us. And that's exactly what Jesus does for us. He takes the punishment, the weight of our sin upon himself in order to give us credit for his perfect holy life, his perfect righteousness. And so just like last week's passage where we are made alive because of Christ individually, we read now that we are brought near to Christ corporately as a people. Because of what Christ has done for us. We can find peace with God only through Christ. Verse 13 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And so that command Paul gave them to remember where they were, that they were separated from Christ, that command now extends all the way to verse 13 where Paul's telling them to remember where you were, but remember where you are now. Remember what Christ has done for you. That by his blood, he has brought us near to God. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. That in our sin we're separated from God, but in Christ we're brought near. To him, And so the only way Christ could bring us back to God is by his blood. His perfect life, 
made him the perfect sacrifice to take the punishment for our sin. And so he became our substitute so that he could bring us to God. He took our punishment upon himself and we receive credit for his perfect life, which allows us to be reconciled to God, which allows there to be peace between us and God. And so that's why Jesus himself is our peace. As verse 14 says, Jesus is the only way that we can have peace with God. And when we believe in Jesus in faith, Romans 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jesus, through his life, his death, and his resurrection, brings us to God. And I just want to pause quick and say, if there's anyone here who this morning, or maybe somebody who's listening later um, online, if you've never done that, if you've never come to a place where you're at peace with God by trusting in Jesus to carry that weight of your sin, if you've never done that, he invites you, he calls you to do that today. To just trust that Jesus, through his life, death, and resurrection, can carry that burden of your sin in a way you're never going to be able to. That you can find that peace in your life and your peace with God only through Jesus. So he calls you to do that today. And if somebody here hasn't done that and they want to talk about what it means to do that, I would love to talk and walk through that with you. Or if you're online watching this later, reach out to me online and we'll, we'll talk through that together. But since Jesus Christ brings us peace, he brings us peace both between us and God, and he makes peace possible between us and other people. Verse 16 says that the blood of Christ brings us near so that he might reconcile us to God. And so Jesus' blood first makes vertical reconciliation possible, right? Reconciliation between us and God. And when that hostility between us and God, when there's peace, that when that hostility is broken, where there's now peace between us and God, verse 18 tells us that we now have access to God. Verse 18 says, For through him we both Jew and Gentile have access. We have access in one spirit to the Father. Okay? When we're reconciled, we're adopted, we're chosen, part of God's family, we now get direct access to the Father. Right? We get God's presence with us continually. And we can talk to Him. We can go to Him directly, in prayer, whenever and in whatever situation we might find ourselves in. But the amazing thing is that vertical peace makes horizontal peace possible. Okay? Vertical peace, peace between us and God, makes peace between us and other, peace, other people possible. One of the results of being separated from God is that a lack of peace vertically inevitably leads to a lack of peace horizontally between other people, between groups of people. And so be, to be able to reconcile horizontal relationships between people, the first step in that is always going to be that vertical relationship with us and God needs to be reconciled. There needs to be peace vertically before there will be peace horizontally. Because the cross of Christ makes forgiveness and makes peace possible. It makes lasting forgiveness. It makes self-denying love between people possible. It makes peace possible at an individual level. But more what our passage is talking about here is peace at a corporate level. Peace between groups of people now drawn together as God forms his church. As he forms one people. As he redeems a people for himself. In verses 14 and 15, Paul writes that Christ has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. And so at the time that Paul was writing this, one of the, the greatest divides in that part of the world was between Jew and Gentile, between Jew and non-Jew. Jews went to great lengths at that time to make sure that they interacted as little as possible with, with non-Jews. Uh, the Jewish historian Josephus tells us that there was a literal wall standing in the temple that kept the Gentiles out. And on this wall, he tells us that there were signs in both Greek and Latin warning that any Gentiles could not go any further or they would die. 
Okay, that's how serious the divide between Jew and Gentile was at that time. And so I don't think we appreciate in our, in our kind of Western culture today how great that divide between people was at that time. But the, not only the physical temple, but the law of commands and ceremonial laws mentioned here, or really the, the Mosaic law, also put a barrier between Jew and Gentile. But through his life and his death and his resurrection, Christ comes and fulfills this law. And in fulfilling this law on our behalf, he abolishes it. Right? He removes any condemnation that we would have for our inability to follow the law. And so he accomplishes what we could never accomplish. And so what we see here is, is Jesus, if you remember back to when we talked about the physical temple, right? in the inner part of the temple was the Holy of Holies, this innermost part where God's presence was said to, to dwell there, right? And it was separated by this, this veil. And when Christ was crucified, that veil was torn from top down, signifying that we now have direct access to God. Okay, so, so Christ not only tore the veil between us and God, allowing there to be peace, allowing to reconcile us vertically, he also broke down that dividing wall between Jew and Gentile, between groups of peoples, so that there can now be horizontal peace between us. Okay, because without that horizontal peace, there's no church. And so that's why he took that step to be able to allow there to be peace between us as he forms his church. Right? He does this so he can create one new man out of the two. Right? A, a, a one new people from every tribe, nation, and tongue, language of the world. All for the purpose of bringing him glory as he builds his church. Okay? So that we can join together now from every nation around the globe. And so think about this. Think about it this way. I want you to think about all the wars all the battles that have happened throughout human history. Think of all the nations that have fought against one, and one another throughout human history. That's a lot of violence. That's a lot of death. That's a lot of hostility. Okay? Yet, as we've talked about multiple times in our study here through Ephesians, one of the ultimate ways that God is displaying His glory, that's God's ultimate purpose, display His glory to the world. One of the ultimate ways He does that is by redeeming a people for himself. Okay, redeeming a people who will worship him for all of eternity. So you think about every war that has happened throughout human history, and now you think about God's great purpose, that there's going to be people from every nation of the world worshiping together God from all eternity. Right? People that have fought one another for centuries, worshiping God together for all of eternity. Right, as Revelation 7 verse 9 tells us, Behold, a great multitude, multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands. That's God's ultimate purpose realized in Revelation 7. A great people, multitude no one can number, all redeemed and glorifying Him. So we think about all the wars throughout human history. See how God is so greatly glorified in now bringing people from all of those nations together to worship Him for all of eternity. Right? It's truly, truly amazing here. The point here then is that Christ has established peace. He's made peace possible so that all who are His might no longer be strangers both to God and to each other. But because of the gospel, we can now live as peace, at peace, as fellow citizens, as fellow family members in the household of God. As verse 19 says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. This is tremendous peace. This is reconciliation, tremendous forgiveness made possible because of Christ. I recently uh, started reading a book called uh, As We Forgive, Stories of Reconciliation from Rwanda. And it, it, what it's about, it's about the uh, genocide that happened in Rwanda in the 1990s. And it details some of the horrors that happened in this genocide, but it also documents the, some of these tremendous acts of forgiveness and reconciliation that have happened in the years since then. One of the stories that was included in the book was that of a girl named Joy. 
Uh, Joy was a Rwandan Tutsi. So during the genocide, you had these two groups. The Hutus were the ones committing the genocide against the Tutsis um, during the the, um, um, genocide at that time. And Joy... Uh, Tutsi, her father was murdered and her house was burned by this group of Hutu who were actually neighbors of hers, who knew her. Years later, after the genocide had happened, Joy was at a Christian boarding school where she received a letter from her mom. Two of the men, who, two neighbors of hers, had, who were responsible for burning her house and killing her father, had written a letter to her mom, had reached out to her mom and wanted to meet face to face in order to ask for her forgiveness. And so Joy's mom was writing to her to give her the option to see if she wanted to meet with these men face to face as well. And so her mother did meet with them and was ultimately able to forgive them. But as as her mother met with the men. The, the, the men was, it was a father and a son. And the father shared that he was the one leading the group that had killed her husband, or Joy's father, and burned their house down. And he said to her that while he was in prison, so tens and tens of thousands of these Hutus who were participated in the genocide were rounded up and put into prison. And he said while he was in prison, some men of God came and preached the gospel to them. They helped them understand the evil they had committed and helped them find hope in the forgiveness of God. And since their vertical relationship between these guys who had committed horrendous atrocities, since there was now peace between them and God, that moved them to want to seek forgiveness and peace with Joy and her family. And so initially, Joy couldn't bring herself to even think about forgiving them, let alone meeting them. But as she spent time at this boarding school, she began really growing in her relationship with God. And eventually, she came to find this deep sense of peace. Or Actually, I would say this, this deep sense of peace came and found her. She said that a strange peace settled in her heart, prompting her to now be able to forgive And the author uh, writes this about joy. She writes, And the more joy had come to understand the significance of the Bible's teachings on Jesus Christ's death, the more forgiveness seemed possible. She learned how Christ had been executed in a horrible manner, more horrible than some of the things she had seen in the war. And she learned how he willingly died to pay the penalty for her wrongdoing and for anyone else who would give up their bad ways and look to him. If Christ could forgive her, if he could forgive the people who tortured him, then Joy knew she could forgive too. End quote. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the only power, it's the only power in the world that can make that kind of reconciliation, that kind of forgiveness possible. Only through the gospel of Jesus Christ Is forgiveness like that possible? No other power can bring people together like the gospel of Jesus. And so just imagine, for all of eternity, there's going to be Rwandan Hutus and Rwandan Tutsis worshiping God together for all of eternity, even though for centuries they've been at war with one another. Okay, It's incredible. It's incredible. So we go from strangers to being fellow citizens in God's kingdom when we believe in faith. Okay. Next then, along with the, describing the church as fellow citizens and, and describing us as fellow members of God's household, Paul uses another analogy to describe God's church. He uses the analogy of a temple. A temple. Again, if you remember back when we were going through 1 Kings earlier this year, we talked about the construction of the temple in Jerusalem. And we talked about the purposes behind the physical temple that was built in Jerusalem. And we talked about two main purposes. The first was the temple. Through the sacrifices, the animal sacrifices that happened there, that was how God determined that he would atone for Israel's sin. Okay? This was a temporary system set up that allowed for a holy God to be reconciled with unholy man okay, for a time. And we talked about how those sacrifices that happened there pointed us forward to Jesus and his ultimate sacrifice that made it possible for us to be at peace with God once and for all. Right? But then the second purpose of the temple was 
simply to proclaim, display, and reflect God's glory, right? That's why it was so ornate and, and so uh, amazing was because it was displaying God's glory to the world. And so as God now takes the people he is redeeming from every nation, every tribe and every language, he takes them and he builds us into a temple for the Lord. Okay, we're now a living building that is joined together and grows together. Okay, and the foundation of this living building, it says, are the apostles and prophets, which we could really understand as God's word. God's word becomes a foundation with Christ as the cornerstone. Okay, Christ, meaning Christ has the most prominent and most important position among us, okay, among the church, that everything is set according to Christ. Everything rests upon him. And so our purpose then becomes very much the same as the physical temple back in ancient Israel, right? Our purpose as the living temple today is what? Point people to how they can find reconciliation and peace with God through Jesus and to proclaim, display, and reflect the glory of God. And so our purpose as the temple of God becomes the same as the physical temple. Help people find reconciliation and peace with Christ, through Christ, and to proclaim the glory of God. Okay, that's our purpose as the church. And we now do both of these things through the type of people we are growing into, the type of lives that we live. We live lives that engage people in order to help them find peace with God. And we live lives of godly character and works that reflect God's character and works in the world. And so with all of this in mind, I want to kind of move us to close here with with two main points of application. So first, this means we desperately need to rethink our understanding of the church. Okay, if you're participating in our core training, this is going to be the topic of our next session Wednesday night. What is the church? Because for too long and for too many Christians, we view the church as a place that you go. Right? We see it more like a restaurant. If we go to that restaurant and our needs are met, we have a good time there, we're going to come back. Right? So we're looking more, what can we get out of it? Or we see it as, the, as a service, right? We see it as the Sunday morning gathering. We equate that to church. But when we have that understanding of church, we kind of lob off the other six days of the week, don't we? From our definition and our understanding of church. And we fail to see it as a people, a people of God who are living their purpose together, all for the glory of God. And so God forms us into a people bound together by Jesus Christ with a shared purpose and a shared mission. Okay, so we're not a place. We're not just a weekly meeting. We're not a scattered collection of individuals. Right? We're a people. We're a people whose faith is in God from around the world. And so this is why our sermon series is called Living Our Purpose Together. Right? Living Our Purpose Together. Because you can't live your purpose that God has for you on your own. Okay? Trying to live out your faith, live out your purpose on your own, completely contradicts the definition of a church, completely contradicts God's purpose for the world. Okay, so we need to rightly understand what the church is. And so this Wednesday evening, we're going to dive into that some, some more at our next core training session. And next Sunday, our passage is actually going to shed some more light on what the church is uh, as well and what God is doing through the church. Okay, so we need to rightly understand what the church is first. My second application point is a question then. So we've talked about this morning how Jesus has broken down the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile so that he could form one new people. And so he's working to form a people. And he's broken down a dividing wall to make that happen. And so my question is, if Christ has torn down that wall, what walls have we built? What walls maybe have we rebuilt in our lives between us who know the gospel and those who have yet to know the gospel? What dividing wall have we put in our lives to separate us who have the gospel from those who don't yet know the gospel? What in your life keeps you isolated, never engaging with those who are far from God? One of the reasons we're prayer walking our community this summer is so that God might refresh in our hearts, a love for the people around us. 
right? And that as he refreshes our love for our community, that he might tear down any walls that we've built in our lives that keep us separated. That through prayer and motion, God might draw us toward those that he is drawing towards himself. And that he might reveal to us areas in our community that he's calling us to engage in at a deeper level, all for his glory. And so we need to humbly and honestly examine our lives and ask, in what ways have we built walls in our lives that separate us from those who need the gospel? And how is the love of God shown to us through the gospel, working on us, working on our hearts to demolish those walls as well? So because of Jesus, because of the gospel, we now no longer have to live as strangers, isolated and separated from Jesus, separated from the promises of God, or hostile to God and hostile to other people. But we can now live in peace as fellow citizens of God's kingdom. We can now live as Christ's church, proclaiming, reflecting, and multiplying his love, grace, and truth.